Alyssa Hayes is a native Austinite who attended Texas A&M University. She had written uh, poetry in high school and while at A&M, she worked as an editorial assistant in the office of Kalalu, a journal of literature, art, and culture of the African diaspora, as I think a bunch of you know. She also took part in multiple Kalalu creative writing workshops. Most importantly, she met a great friend while working for Kalalu, Mick White. She was introduced to poetry in high school through Robert Frost. He has always been one of her favorite poets, alongside Yusuf Kamunyaka, Ai, Louise Gluck, and Natasha Treadway. Since graduating from school, Alyssa has moved into a job at a software company where she leads what she calls a quiet double life, writing when she can. She's thankful to be here today to have um, a bit more art in her life. And um, I, I, um, I don't have a um, characterizing anecdote to share about Alyssa, um, but I, but I, I think that unless there's somebody with the same name uh, online, that she won a National Poetry Prize when she was in high school, which I think is, is kind of cool. Okay, uh, please welcome Alyssa Hayes. Thanks for having us here and uh, for inviting me. I haven't read in a while, so it's be a little shaky, but uh, thank you for the introduction as well. I'm going to start with a poem that was published in Callaway. Uh, I got the chance to work with a lot of writers while I was there and to get a few of my things published. So, Rituals, the baptism. Father, dipping me into water. Your little girl's gone blue. Fish eyes all wide and ready for four. I won't ever stop breathing in this river's blood, this high current rumble. From below, the sun is a good star, and we are not ourselves. I know you, and I know this is not you. Give me a good push, one good push down, and I swear, Papa, I won't ever come to a man's hands again. Um, so I'm here with a bunch of people who write fiction. And um, I just wanted to do something that was a little different. Uh, I had the chance to get some, spend some time with my family, the family that I don't get to visit, which we all have. And I was trying to get some writing done at the same time, and it didn't work, um, as you might guess. But my family knows that I'm a writer, so they would go out of their way to tell me things and try and get me to record it and think about it and use it. Um, so. I got a chance to just take some time to listen to what people said, and there are some really amazing quotes that I got from that. I uh, just wanted to read a few of them. You know, my, my grandfather told me about his father. He says, my father had five wives, but he was buried alone. He died alone. He choked while eating soup. He drowned. You know, just listening to some of the things that people said is just pretty amazing. Um, one of the things that my grandfather didn't talk about was the war that he participated in, and so I wrote a poem for him. The Flood. Sometimes I wake before my wife, heavier than the darkness in the bay windows, than the blue-black crows. Before I make coffee, a slime skims the golf green as sweet as any white sugar. Dampness means I've got time for the sun to buoy over Georgia pine and drown maples in black blood. My heart rose from the field nameless, one of those morning birds calling out a slender throat. Now my words shudder and halt, iron wheels stuck to a body. A glass upturns and everything seeps through stars. People only see what I leave behind, pins and whistles, medallions, a uniform. Mornings like this, before the coffee slips <clears throat> from one vessel into another. God forgives me, an ordinary man. I like to sit and wait. Um, this next one I wasn't planning to read, but then Mick asked me to read it, so it's been a little while. It's a little longer, 
so bear with me. This is another one that was published in Calu. It's called Pine Needles. And we are laughing, our backs hunched up like children, us siblings sharing a game. Let our voices roll with the smoke that inhabits pool halls like this one. We are laughing loud, noxious, burly laughter of ones who forget who they are and why they are there. We are laughing with our eyes shutting in and blinking back out to each other's drawn up faces, blank and tight as paper napkins, wet from drinks, wet from thinking of things, the tiniest green moths we thought of trying to forget that pushed themselves behind our eyes, flickering, pushed back, it did not stop, could not stop, our faces white as pale, as clean, as starting over, new slate, caught in that flickering, fluttering, pushing on, more of us leaving in those laughs to go out and become thunder, become the children who trap thunder in their, in their mouths, or lightning thoughts in jars, believing the world to have more than one world, and that things can be clean, can be starting over, can be new, fresh slate left behind, over, over, over. He'd have done pulled the balls back into the hole by now. He could do anything, says our brother back into the bar. By now he'd have pulled them all in, clean and easy, like this, like death. Like the man walking towards his own death who stops to check his watch, stops to think of the groceries he needs, who to call, who to avoid, walking towards his own death, pulling the things he can't forget to the roofless mouth like honey, like cedar. Yeah, right, we walked those hills all night, got lost, some fault of something, the moon tickling us through pines. We pick needles and poke them into our wrists to stay awake. That was some fault of something my sister chokes out laughing in the bar we went to to forget, to remember, to lose what we had lost together and make it less sacred than it was, with moths and nameless green bugs catching the light, fluttering down to the green felt and disappearing to where we might have swallowed some. Laughing in the liquor, crawling down our throats, burrowing a hole in the heart, connected to the head of a man, the body who loses himself and thinking, which one we are laughing, which one of us? Was the man thinking when he crossed that street, which child did he think of as the cars warmed down into pavement, him needing some kind of release from the honey like a thing's held in the back of the mouth? He refused to voice because words are magpies crowding sky, melding into more, because he does not think to speak of dropping balls, heavy as silence after a long last night, because his words, thick with feathers, lost in flesh, can't measure a heart or its pulsing or the pulsing of other hearts, which go on beating breathlessly in the car of silence. Like moths gathering to porch light, wanting to be heard and sung to and reassured, even if only by echoes, because, because words are too much and not enough, we laugh, unseen under the dusky pools of our tables, too drunk to lie to each other, watching the sweet, heavy, white ball force itself into all the others, aching to reach the black one and start a new game. We ask, we ask laughing, which one, which one does he love more? Uh, I'm waiting for Mick to sort of tell me what my time is there. Okay, so um, I didn't bring a ton of things, but I definitely wanted to read uh, this one. It's one that I haven't had a chance to, to publish yet. Um, you know, I keep coming back to the theme of family. I think for a book, my first book, since I don't have one, it's probably going to be that, just because I can't quite get rid of it. Um, so. Here goes, at 54. My mother doesn't argue with the empty house anymore. She blows mosquito candles out one by one. Each night and moments, the greasy flames are gone to smoke in the face. Our neighbors watch her frame flicker on the porch. Darkness rides over their eyes, and June bugs cease to click through the window screens. This late in summer, fireflies die, but moonlit, the creek bed contorts in syncopated bloom. She goes on in the kitchen, cooking someone else's dinner, watering her rosemary and hanging pots while dry sprigs branch from carpet underfoot. She can't stop saving lives. Every reluctant hummingbird caught on the honeysuckle fence is hers. And technically, that's all I was planning to read for today, but I don't know if I still have some time. Yeah, do one more. Do, do one more. Do one more, they say. One more. Um, okay, real fast. Let me go ahead and grab one. Uh, so I've, I've been trying to work through writing a poem in a much more sort of fiction-oriented manner and playing on the idea of um, family. Uh, this is a poem for my father. Sometimes you, it takes time to really figure out who your parents are. That's about all I can say. His stories. This is a good porch, but I gotta get it stained. 
Remember, we didn't stay in the one last year and it fell apart. We got dry heat today. Summer's going to be hot this year. You remember when we used to go down to Padre, we used to go down there and stay in that hotel by the beach, the Tiki. It was cool and dark in the mornings, all concrete and salt air. I used to get you up early to check the crab traps and go fishing. Remember that one time there was a big blue crab right at the door. You wanted to keep him, bring him home. Remember getting up and going out blinded by all that sun on the waves. I tried to teach you how to leap your line in an arc right out to the buoy with one twist, one fleck of the wrist, real sharp. Remember? It's hot today, but at least we got a good breeze up here on the porch. Jim's porch is pretty nice too. After he died, they had an open house. He had new floors inside and a two-level deck and a swimming pool back there. Maybe 400 square feet, that's all. His fence is high. That's the secret. A yard with a high fence, no see-through. The deer are afraid to jump over. They don't jump unless they know where to land. They can't see through that wood. Jim had bunches of flowers out there, daisies, I think, right up against the windowsill. We can't do that down here with the deer in our yard every night. But I'm not going to replace that chain link fence. That would be too much. Besides, it's nice to see out every once in a while. You see that squirrel? That's the sucker that comes out here on the porch and lays on the railing all afternoon. He bathes. He ain't afraid of us. He just takes his time. I came out here last week and almost got near enough to touch him, but then he skirted up and spooked me bad. I nearly stumbled back into the door and a cloud of sparrows came rushing up out of that mountain world right there. <laughs>